Hi everyone. So uh, I'm making this recording from home because I'm not supposed to come into campus until Monday. So unfortunately, the lighting situation is even worse than usual. Or maybe it's better than usual. Maybe this is not as bad. Maybe I should always have been doing this. I don't know. Uh, anyway, what I want to talk about today, and I do apologize for the whole uh, stuff that's been going on here, but yeah, I haven't been feeling very well. Fortunately, I'm feeling pretty well now, and uh, yeah, so everything should be getting back to normal here soon, although we may have a few more things this week where I ask you to take a look at some outside resources just to sort of finish things up, because I have been feeling off and on this week. Anyway, uh, what are we looking at this week? Well, I want to start off by talking about an application of calculus, one of the most sort of common applications of calculus in some ways, and this is optimization problems. Okay, this is not the pen that I thought it was. I do, in fact, have a working pen here. I swear. It's just a question of figuring out which one of these four it is. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, so optimization problems. And there's a lot of different optimization problems that you can think of potentially, but all of them come down to the same basic idea. You either want to make something as large as it can be, or you want to make something as small as it can be. And both of these problems can be approached using calculus. Why? Well, it probably, if you spend a minute thinking about it, you might come up with the answer. The reason is because calculus enables us to find the local maximums and minimums and if I want to really optimize something, a global maximum or minimum is going to have to either occur at some kind of an endpoint, or it's going to have to happen at a local maximum or minimum. So if I want to maximize or minimize something, uh, I'm actually going to want to, you know, use calculus methods to figure out how do I get something to be as large as possible, how do I get it to be as small as possible, and then that is going to uh, tell me how to optimize the situation. So sometimes you might want to make something as large as possible. You may want to be efficient. Like what is the largest container that we can make of a given type? Uh, in other cases, you may want to make something as small as possible. Maybe you're trying to minimize costs or maybe you're trying to minimize the amount of material that you need to use or something like this in order to make a container. Or, uh, you know, you can come up with other things, like you're trying to minimize the amount of fuel that you use on a given trip, things like this. In fact, that is a, a very interesting one because it turns out that there is a lot of stuff in physics that comes down to things happen in the most efficient way possible. For instance, Snell's law tells us that light will always take the pathway that locally minimizes the time required for the journey. That's a little bit of a weird way of saying it, but it comes down to the light will always take the most efficient route. Now, because of that, uh, you can do things like calculate, well, if we're going to have light move between two different materials, like let's say it moves between air and glass, how much is the light going to bend in the process? Uh, and the answer is, well, it comes down to the fact that the light takes the most efficient route. Give me one moment here. So yeah, uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can look up Snell's Law, and the derivation of Snell's Law turns out to really just be a fairly, not entirely straightforward, but like it's nothing too complicated in terms of an application of calculus. So uh, it's an interesting little thing. Maybe we'll talk about that later. I don't know. Uh, it depends upon whether I decide to specifically focus in on that. But for those of you with an interest in physics, you may want to look up Snell's Law and how that uh, relates to calculus. So in the meantime, I want to actually start off by talking about some maybe a little bit uh, simpler optimization problems that we can deal with. So here is an example of an optimization problem. Let's suppose we have 
uh, let's say, 40 feet of fencing. And we want to know how can we build the largest rectangle possible. using those 40 feet of fencing. So this is going to be a problem where we want to maximize something. We want to maximize the area. And usually when you are dealing with one of these optimization problems, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to start off by writing down all of the information that you have. Um, and then you want to figure out what is it that you are trying to maximize or minimize. Also figure out if you're trying to maximize it or minimize it, because if you're trying to maximize something and you end up minimizing it, then people are not going to be particularly happy with you and with those results. Similarly, if you are trying to minimize something and you end up accidentally maximizing it, yeah, people probably aren't going to be pleased if you come back and you say, yep, we've managed to maximize the cost for you. Uh, unless you're working for the government, then they might be happy. But, you know, normal people will not be happy with you in that case. So how can we build the largest rectangle possible uh, in terms of area here? So let's start off by thinking about the situation that we've got, and we'll make a little bit of a diagram. So we're going to have some sort of a rectangle here, and we'll call the base of the rectangle X and the height of the rectangle Y then the area here is going to be equal to x times y. That's, you know, nothing particularly groundbreaking here. That's literally just uh, the formula for the area of a rectangle. And then the other thing that I know here is that the perimeter is going to have to be equal to 40 feet because we know that we've got 40 feet of fencing and that amount of fencing is going to go into the perimeter. So the perimeter is equal to 40 feet, but it is also equal to 2x plus 2y. Because, well, yeah, I'm just using the perimeter formula here. Hopefully you can see where the perimeter comes from. Now, when you have an optimization problem like this, you will often end up with multiple equations. And we need to be careful about which equation we use for which thing. This is the equation that we want to maximize. So this is also known as the optimization equation. Or sometimes this is called the objective equation. So why is it called the objective equation? The way that I remember this is our objective is to optimize this equation. So this is the equation that really describes our goal. Our goal in this case is going to be how do we get the biggest area possible? The other equations are going to be equations that you're not trying to optimize. Instead, what these equations are is they're going to be fixed quantities that relate the different measurements involved in the problem. So in this case, we have a measurement of X and we have a measurement of Y. But these two are not independent of one another. They are actually closely related. In fact, what we see here is that 40 has to be equal to 2X plus 2Y. Equations like this are called constraints. And the way to remember this is a constraint, well, constraining something, uh, you know, it forces it to be equal to something or it forces it to remain within certain parameters. And that is what is going on with these constraint equations. A constraint equation takes our quantities and forces them or fixes them to be equal to a specific quantity. So we're not trying to maximize or minimize the perimeter in this particular problem. Now, other problems, maybe we are trying to maximize or minimize them. Uh, so, you know, don't just assume that you can uh, 
saying, oh, this is always going to be my objective. This is always going to be my constraint. No, it's a question that you got to look at each particular problem and say, what is my objective equation here? What is my constraint equation here? It will depend upon the problem at hand. But in this case, my constraint is going to be the perimeter. So what we can say then, uh, and I'm going to erase this original problem. Hopefully you have it written down by this point. Uh, what we can say then is we want to maximize the area, but the constraint that we have is that the perimeter has to be equal to 40, and the perimeter is 2x plus 2y. So this tells me that x plus y is equal to 20, which tells me that y is equal to 20 minus x. And then what I can do is I can say, well, this means that the area as a function of x is going to equal x times 20 minus x. Now, the other thing that we can say here is that the <laughs> domain here is 0 is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 20. Why can I say that? Well, the point is that uh, the skinniest that I could make this rectangle is if x were literally equal to 0. So I just had two parallel fences running up and down. But then I could also make this the widest I wanted, which would mean making it a 20-foot fence horizontally and no vertical direction whatsoever. The reason that this is important is because in a moment, I'm going to need to argue that I've really maximized this thing. And so I do, in fact, want to uh, be able to potentially talk about the domain here. We also want to be careful with the domain because sometimes you end up solving for something and you find different local maxima and minima, but you do want to make sure that you're actually talking about a maximum or a minimum that is in the domain for the problem at hand. If it's not in the domain, you know, if it doesn't make sense, then it's not a valid answer. For instance, if my answer is, yes, you should have a fence that is negative 30 feet, well, that doesn't make any sense physically. A fence can't be a negative length. Okay, so then what we can do is we can say, well, this means that a of x is really negative x squared plus 20x. That means a prime of x is going to equal negative 2x plus 20. And at this point, there's a few different ways that I can go about this. So I can say, well, the second derivative of the area is negative 2. There's only one critical point here, and that's going to be negative 2x plus 20 equals 0. That gives me x equals 10. And this has to be a local maximum because the second derivative is negative. But I can also just observe that, well, the area when x is equal to 10 is 10 times 10 equals 100, whereas at the endpoints, the area is going to be 0 in both cases. Either way, what this tells me is that x equals 10 is the only local maximum, and therefore it is a global maximum as well. So what we want to do is we want to make one side of the fence be 10 feet, and that means that we want to make the other side 10 feet as well, because 20 minus 10 would still be 10. And there we go. This is how we would make the largest rectangular region possible. We would want to actually make it a square, because if you think about what this is going to end up looking like then, if we go back to our little sketch, well, this is going to be a 10 foot by 10 foot square. Now this is kind of interesting uh, and maybe not super surprising because in some sense it's not really surprising maybe that what we end up with is sort of this symmetry, right? The square is the most symmetric rectangle that we can get. And so maybe you would sort of expect that this would in fact be the most efficient shape. 
Well, it's the most efficient rectangle. It's not necessarily the most efficient shape, okay? So be careful about that. It's the most efficient rectangular shape is a square, but actually the most efficient shape is something else. And I'm curious if you can maybe take a guess at what the most efficient shape would be in general. So what if I allowed myself to think about just fencing in a region with any shape that I like? Uh, what would be the way that I can contain the most area with a fixed amount of fencing? Well, the answer is, and it is not obvious necessarily, but when I talked about that symmetry stuff, maybe it's sort of clear why this would be the case. The answer is that the most efficient shape for fencing is actually a circle. Circles contain the most area for their perimeter of any shape. Now, how do you prove that this is true? Well, it turns out that what you need to do is you need to generalize calculus quite a bit. See, what we're studying in Calc 1, and if you take Calc 2, what you'll study in Calc 2 is what is known as single variable calculus. So we deal with functions, basically, that depend upon a single variable. In Calc 3, you deal with functions that deal, uh, that are multivariable. So a function that depends upon more than one variable. It turns out that in order to talk about this kind of thing, what you really need to be able to do is to talk about calculus with an infinite number of variations. So this is proved using something called calculus of variations. Calculus of variations is a really, really interesting field of study. Uh, it has some really interesting applications in physics that you would not at all expect. And it has all kinds of really cool results. Particularly, there's something called Netter's theorem, which deals with the relationships between symmetries and conserved quantities in physics. And I would say this is probably the most important result in all of um, in all of physics, or at least all of classical mechanics, because it turns out this is a result that is not simply true for some particular physics situation. It's true of all possible classical mechanics theories. But anyway, it turns out that you can show the most efficient shape is the circle. Uh, and in fact, in terms of this calculus of variation stuff, I should also mention Kate Ullenbeck a couple of years ago uh, ended up winning the Abel Prize, a very high-end mathematical prize for her work in the calculus of variations. That in particular was looking at some stuff with surfaces and bubble shapes and things like that. So it was actually dealing with this kind of question in a lot of ways just moved up a dimension. Well, a few dimensions, really. Uh, but yeah, so she was looking at these kinds of problems and using these kinds of techniques. But really, the questions she was looking at, in a lot of ways, come down to just the same kinds of questions as we're trying to answer here. It's just, you know, in a slightly more complicated context. All right, so let's now take a look at another type of question here. Uh, moving away from this calculus of variation stuff. Let's take a look at what if we sort of wanted to ask the opposite sort of questions here. So what if instead of fixing the perimeter uh, and asking you to build the largest possible rectangle, what if instead we ask what is the least fencing we can use to build a, let's say, a 64 square meter rectangular pen. So this is a similar question to what we were asking a minute ago, but it is quite different in some ways. Like the setup is kind of similar, but what's going on is really sort of different. And that's why I want to show you this problem 
and compare it to the previous problem because it really is uh, worth thinking about what the differences are. In particular, in this case, well, let's once again draw a picture of what's going on. We're going to have a rectangle so we can talk about the base of the rectangle being X and the side of it being Y. But here's the difference, and this is really important. In this case, the area is fixed at 64 square meters and is going to be equal to X times Y. And this time, the area is going to be the constraint. My objective equation is going to be the perimeter, which is going to be 2X plus 2Y. So this is important because last time, the area was our objective equation and the perimeter was the constraint. This time, the perimeter is the objective and the area is the constraint. So from this constraint, we can say that y equals 64 divided by x. And this means that the perimeter as a function of x is going to be 2x plus 2 times 64 divided by x. Uh, so this means that if I take the derivative with respect to x, this is going to give me 2 minus 128 x to the minus 2. Now, what are the constraints going to be, or what is the domain going to be here? Well, we're going to have the requirement that x needs to be strictly bigger than 0. The reason x has to be strictly bigger than 0 is because we need the area to be equal to 64. And the only way that's possible is if the length of this side is something non-zero. But in theory, it could be literally anything, any positive number. Uh, now, if I set this equal to 0, 2 minus 128 over x squared equals 0, you solve this, you're going to get x is equal to 8. So that is the only critical point that we have. <coughs> and the other thing that we can say is that p double prime, the second derivative, is going to be equal to uh, why am I suddenly confused by what it's going to be equal to? 256x to the minus 3. There we go. So, p double prime at x equals 8, this thing is actually concave up for all uh, x bigger than 0. So this is bigger than 0 when x is bigger than 0. Since we are concave up at x equals 8, that means x equals 8 is a minimum. And that means we do, in fact, minimize this uh, expression when x is equal to 8. So we minimize the perimeter by setting x equal to 8, and that would mean that y is also equal to 8. So the shape that we're really looking for is we want to make an 8 by 8 pen, 8 meters by 8 meters. Once again, this is kind of similar to what we found last time, but it is a little bit different. In our first problem, I was asking if I uh, fix the amount of fencing that I have, what is the biggest I could make the area? And how do I do that? Well, the answer was you make it into a square and you know that's how you maximize the area. In this case, my question was instead, if I want to build a rectangle, that has a fixed area, how can I do that with the minimum amount of fencing? Well, the answer was once again, you make the thing into a square and that is going to give you your uh, most efficient region. But we're sort of asking the opposite sort of question. In the first one, we were asking, how do we maximize the area? In this one, we were asking, how do we minimize the perimeter? Now let's take a look at a slightly more complicated sort of situation here uh, where we want to still 
be able to uh, figure out these kinds of things. So let's say that this time, we have, let's say, 80 meters of fencing. And what we want to do is we want to build a rectangular area along a river. And presumably, we don't need to actually fence things in along the river. So we have the river forming one side of our rectangle. And our question is, how long should the fence parallel to the river be to maximize the area. So here's what's going on here. Uh, we have a rectangle and we've got an, a, a river, which I'm indicating with the sort of wavy line here. I know that doesn't look much like a river, but that's what it's supposed to be. And then we have these two sides on the edge here. So the only part that I actually need to fence in is the part with this X and with these two Ys. And so what we can say is that our constraint is going to be that the 80 meters of fencing is equal to x plus 2 times y. And then my objective equation is the area, which is equal to x times y. I want to maximize this area. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to rewrite this so that it is purely a function of x. And we're going to say the area as a function of x, uh, let's see. So this would mean that y equals 1 half times 80 minus x. So this is going to be x times 1 half times 80 minus x. So there is a of x. And so this is going to become negative one-half x squared plus 40x. So then a prime of x is going to be equal to negative x plus 40. Uh, a double prime of x is going to equal negative 1. If we find the critical point, so say, take negative x plus 40, set that equal to zero, that gives me x equals 40. And this is in fact a maximum because the uh, second derivative is negative at x equals 40. In fact, it's negative everywhere, so we're kind of all set there. In fact, we could really say that this is a maximum for other reasons too, because this happens to be a quadratic and we know what quadratics look like. So technically, if you're dealing with a quadratic, you can even solve these types of things using some algebra. You don't even need to mess around with uh, derivatives. But to be honest, doing it with calculus is just as easy usually. And we want to do it that way to make sure that you actually understand how to do this stuff with calculus. So uh, what we want to do then is we want to make the side of the fence parallel to the river. This should be 40 meters long. That means the other two sides should be 20 meters long, which is kind of interesting if you think about it, because what this is telling me is that the side along with the fencing, in some sense, each piece of the fence that I use there is sort of doubly efficient because I get the length of the fence plus its length along the river for free. And it turns out that exactly what we want to end up with is making the side that's parallel to the river uh, twice the length of this, these other two sides, right? 40 meters versus 20 meters. 
So it's not really a coincidence that this happened, but the fact that it ends up working out this way is something that you sort of see by using calculus like this. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an introduction to some of these optimization problems. Now we're gonna talk about more optimization problems in a future video here, but I'm going to leave things off here for the moment for you and uh, encourage you to take a little bit of time, make sure that you go over these examples, make sure that you understand them, and then we'll look over some somewhat more complicated examples next time to see what we can do with those.